My, uh, my uh, talk is, uh, is one that I threatened to do for a while. Uh, originally, it was going to be called Six Things I've Learned Since I Became 60. But then I couldn't remember whether it was six. Maybe it was five or seven. So I think we just called it Stuff I've Learned. Now I'm 60. And um, one of the things I've learned is authenticity. Um, it wasn't in my original group, but I love that song. But I cannot sing Who I Feel Like Dancing. Because I don't. Never have, probably never will. So, love that song, never sing the middle eight. That's, but hey, but that's just me. Um, it's, it's a very, very awkward dance, yeah, yeah. So, um, so a few weeks ago, I was 60 and uh, don't really think about it too much. It doesn't really stress me out. However, last week, I walked in the MEC and Andy Campbell said to me, do you want to join our over 50s group? I was really offended. I was like, over, what, what are you talking about over 50s? Then I realized if you'd have said, do you want to join our over 60s group, I would have still qualified. So I was like, what is it you're doing? I thought, you know, maybe, I, you know, just show a little bit of, um, uh, you know, just enthusiasm and support. And he said, we're doing bingo. And I said, no, no, I, I'm, I'm definitely not in your over 50s group. But, but seriously, I feel like on the journey, there's a few things I've learned that have been helpful to me, and maybe they'll be helpful to you. And I'm going to rattle through three of them um, today. Uh, the first one, and it's a fairly obvious one, but very significant in my life, which is this, Jesus is Lord. You see, I can't remember a day when I didn't believe uh, that Jesus is who he says he is. I, I can't remember a day when I haven't thought that, that everything I heard about Jesus is, is true. You see, I was part of the last generation of kids who were sent to Sunday school by their non-believing parents. And so I don't have a spectacular conversion testimony. The, the truth of it is, I don't remember being born. I just know um, that I'm alive. And uh, for many years, I went to uh, either an Anglican church or a Methodist church, and I have no memory of anybody ever preaching the gospel to me. And certainly, nobody ever asked me if I wanted to make a response to the truth of who it was. So it just kind of lived there. And um, people will tell you that the things that actually shipwreck ministries are money, sex, and power. Uh, but in reality, uh, growing up, they were uh, shared with me as the things that were the definition of success. If you could have a great job with lots of money and have at least one girlfriend, then you were successful. And that was the things um, that I ch chased after. And to be honest, certainly in the job front, I, I had a little bit of um, success. But prior to that, the one thing that kind of was the anchor uh, for me, quite literally, because um, it was a symbol of the organization I was part of. I, I, was, I was a kid in the boys' brigade, and then I became a youth leader, or to give it its full title, I was actually a lieutenant in the boys' brigade in, uh, in a church in Hunslet, Leeds, and I worked with brilliantly bonkers kids from really really tough and really difficult backgrounds. And I love these kids, absolutely love them. And, uh, and I recognized, as I, as I reflected on it, one of the reasons that inspired me to that was that I'd been loved by the youth leaders in the Boys Brigade when I was a kid. Now, although I would never have defined it in those words, it was just such an important thing to me. And they begin to give me an insight into what it was like to be fully committed uh, to Jesus. And so it kept me in the orbit of the church and in the orbit of faith. And then in my early 20s, when my career really began um, to take off, God orchestrated it. So I began to connect with um, people who had a passion for him. Oh, actually, they were also successful. They had, they had money, and some of them were from quite privileged backgrounds, and not, not like me, but they had this passionate love for Jesus. And and, and it, it almost defined their reason uh, to exist. And it was so attractive to me. I'd never met people like this before. And the more time I spent with them, the more time I wanted to spend with them. 
And, and the more time I spent with them, the more I wanted to be like them, the more I wanted to have what they had. I began to realize that that which I had wasn't bringing me the, 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 the happiness and the success and the, um, you know, just the well-being that I thought it would. And the thing is that Jesus left heaven for idiots like me and, and people like you who could can completely mess up in, in, in their practice, but somewhere in their heart there was, there was something of him that they were seeking out for. I went to a Lewis Palau mission in 1982, and I remember hearing the gospel for the first time. I also remember responding in my heart. I didn't go to the front. I, you know, I wasn't that guy. Um, you know, I'm not particularly proud of that, but I, I didn't. But I did respond in my heart, and it felt to me like... I heard the gospel preached every single week after that. And, um, and I really held on to the fact that, you know, when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. That seemed to me to be demonstrably real. And every single evangelist that I ever encountered, and as I say, it felt like it was on a weekly basis, always said, when you get back to your room tonight, if you invite Jesus into your heart, then you'll never be the same again. You'll wake up tomorrow, you'll feel profoundly different, your life will have changed, and it'll be amazing. And here's the truth. I used to go to my room, invite Jesus into my life, wake up the next morning, and feel exactly the same. I used to go out and I used to do all the things that I'd done the day before. I, I had the same life, the same experience, nothing changed. Life was still the same. Well, except for the fact that the stuff I'd been chasing didn't have the attraction as much. It was slightly less shiny. When I achieved it, it didn't give me the thrill that I thought it might, or even the thrill that I might have received previously. And I began to reflect on this. Well, where is my joy coming from? What is the things that are making me come alive the Bible says in Psalm chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Many ask, who can show us the good? Shine the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with more joy than when grain or new wine abound. I began to realize that hanging out with these crazy, broken kids, take, uh, bringing them to a place where they could hear the gospel was the thing that was giving me the most joy. Hanging out with these newfound Christian friends and developing uh, ministry concepts and ideas, even though I was kind of myself a little bit behind the program, was the thing that was beginning to give me most joy. I had all the treasures, all the toys you could imagine. I had a nice house. I had a company car. In fact, I, at one bit, I had two company cars. Um, I had a fully paid pension scheme. I had a private health care scheme. Uh, my uh, the business was paying for my holidays. I got loads of stuff. I got lots of toys. And then I heard this, uh, this passage of the Bible, and it just transformed me, it, it, and it goes like this. It says, and then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I will do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. I heard that just as I was about to buy my second house. I was a single man, I had a three-bedroom house, and I was about to buy the house next door just because I didn't know what to do with the money that I had. And I suddenly thought, what's the point? What's the point? And there it was. I heard this. And the Bible began to come alive to me. It began to speak to me. Two things happened. One, I went on my knees and I gave my life to God again. And then I had this thought, which I now know is the voice of God, the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Felt the Lord say, well, well, give me your life then. 
Don't just accept me as your Lord and Savior. Make me the Lord of your life. Long story short, I determined there and then I was leaving the world of business. I was going to get myself a job. I went and um, I found myself a job where um, they offered me, originally offered me £2,000 of salary. I was going to take something like a £28,000 cut to go work for a church. And I said to them, I won't come for a penny less than 3000 That was my negotiation. And uh, they accepted my hardball tactics. But they said to me, if you get a better offer in between, don't feel you have to come. And I went to actually work um, for the boys' brigade. I took this cut in salary. I've never, ever regretted it. Not a single day of my life I've ever regretted making Jesus the Lord of my life. And why am I sharing a historic testimony? Something that happened decades ago. Well, the issue is, It's still a live issue. It's still relevant to me, and it's still relevant to you. Not my testimony, but the fact of this. Is Jesus the Lord of my life? It's a daily decision. Sometimes it's actually an hourly decision. Did did I wake up this morning and think, today I'm going to do all I can. I'm going to put you front and center. I'm going to serve you in every thought that I have, in every uh, dis, dis, um, in every discussion I have, in every phone call, in every text, in every email, am I becoming more like Jesus or less like Jesus? For some of us, that's a decision that we need to think about again. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Is it your job? Even though you work for the message. Is it your job? Is it your relationships? Is it your, your search for, for security? Is, is it What is it? If it's not Jesus, I promise you, you will not get the fullness that Jesus promises us in John chapter 10 and verse 10. And also, this is another thing I found, is the Bible. This is my number two. The Bible is true. Just check a look, just watch this two minute video. I just set up what I want to say. The Bible is true in a very strange way. It's true in that it provides the basis for truth itself. And so it's like a meta-truth. Without it, there couldn't even be the possibility of truth. And so maybe that's the most true thing. The most true thing isn't some truth per se. It's that which provides the precondition for all judgments of truth. I can't see any holes in that argument. And I can't see any holes in it from a scientific perspective either because I think we do know well enough now as scientists that the problem of deriving ethical direction from the collection of facts is an intractable problem. There's too many facts. There's an infinite number of facts. They do not provide an unerring guide for action. They can't. There's too many of them. They have to be prioritized. And as soon as they are prioritized, well, then you're in the ethical domain. And then that begs the question, what's the valid ethical domain? And the postmodern answer is, well, there isn't one. It's all the expression of domination and power. And I I think that's nonsense. I I don't think that's a tenable solution. I think that we stumbled onto the proper answer in some sense in our religious enterprise, which is that we aim at what's highest or, or we don't. We aim at what's highest jointly or we're divided. We aim at what's highest, and that gives meaning to all the things we do that are subordinate parts of that. We aim at what's highest, and that's what collects us and gives us structure, all of that, you know, singly and jointly. And that's all what we've been trying to communicate all these centuries as we've been trying to communicate the whole religious corpus, generation after generation, and to sort this out and to straighten it out and to try to understand it. And uh, I think that's where we're at now, maybe a little bit more conscious of what this all means and maybe a little bit more capable of being more certain as people of the book that the faith we have in the textual corpus that we inhabit is we just haven't done better than that. And we strive to flesh it out, we strive to understand it, but fundamentally it seems to be true in that fundamental sense that I just described, which is not merely true, but the precondition for truth itself. The Bible is not merely true. It's the, pre, um, it's the pre, uh, pre-prescribed uh, purpose of what truth actually is. 
And, and whilst you might listen to that and think, oh, you know, I need to listen to it a few more times because it's kind of quite philosophical, the, 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 the guy, Jordan Peterson, has actually come to faith through studying the Bible. He actually did a, a series of lectures on Genesis um, in uh, the University of Toronto, and as a result of that, he actually came to discover this to be true. He used it as a context to actually describe the way that people think, and he began to realize it is true, and, and I've got some good news for you. It is true. For, uh, confession time. For most of my um, le- early life, um, the Bible was an add-on to my lukewarm Christian faith. However, at some point, I realized that I was an untenable position for a disciple. W- what I meant by that is I had to be prepared to embrace vulnerability. And I'm, I'm going to challenge some of you to embrace vulnerability today. I don't want you to make a public expression of it, but I do want you to make a heart expression of vulnerability by by doing what I did, which was to admit that I knew little or nothing of what the Word of God actually said. I had to embrace that in order to make a start. You see, I'd, I'd been in church for so many years as a presumption that I must know this stuff. I must be reading my Bible. There were people saying, when you have your quiet time on the, in the morning and you're reading your Bible, and I knew that I wasn't doing that. And I know that in a, 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 you know, a gathering of, of this size and with this kind of demographic, that it'll be at least true for one person, that they are journeying with um, people of faith and they're not people of the book. But here's what I learned. If you want to make any significant change, if you want to learn anything new, if you want to acquire knowledge, if you want to develop a new skill, it can be soul-destroying. Because the chances are that when you begin it, you won't be very good at it. Whatever it is, whether it's you know, learning pottery, learning to play the guitar, wanting to become a public speaker, or reading the Bible. The chances are you won't be very good at it, and you have to push through, and you have to learn, and that's what being a disciple is. See, when I, when I started a church over 10 years ago, we had what we called the Bible amnesty. We didn't give up our Bibles. What we committed to was to pick them up, but there was going to be no judgment. The only thing that I wanted to know is, did you read more this week than you did last week? Do you understand more this week than you did last week? We're not going to be ashamed. We're not going to be judgmental. We're just going to do it. And I want to say to you here and people listening online, just do it. Pick up the book. Make a start. Today, this word, this word that is a lamp to my feet and to your feet is a light to my path and your path only illuminates when we actually switch it on. If if we accept this book is the word of God and we believe it to be true, then we have to work out what does that really mean. Um, uh, I was a mature student and part of what I I, uh, studied was literacy. And one of the things I learned about literacy was The book that you read isn't necessarily the book that the author wrote. You bring all your own values, all your own prejudices, all your own life experiences to the book, and you read it through your own experience. (laughs) Well, maybe the book that you're reading isn't just the book that God wrote. You need to learn who he is, to learn his character, to learn his understanding. There's lots of ways that we do that. We know that. It's by spending time with him. It's by hanging out with other Christians. It's by, by, by um, journeying with people who've got more experience with us. It's by being part of a, a life-giving community. Uh, but it's also about reading his word. You begin to understand his character. The Bible says, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. What is the intention of the author? Let me just show you. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. I just want to put a painting up for a minute. This is a painting that I saw just um, about six weeks ago. I took my wife to uh, the Tate Gallery in London. And this uh, painting is by Sir Stanley Spencer, and it's called The Resurrection 
Cookham. So Stanley Spencer lived in Cookham. He was a Christian and he was an artist. And he basically did a painting of the, of, of the resurrection of the dead. And uh, basically all the people in there are people who lived in the village. So he's basically saying, it's a big statement, when Jesus comes back, if you know him, you are, well, whether you know him or not, you're going to be, you're going to be brought up out of the grave and you're going to be judged. And here's the thing, in the middle, you can see there's a black patch. Well, actually, if you get close to that, what that is, is um, black people raising, being raised from the dead. It was an outrageous painting, you see, at the time. Most people in the area he lived in, in the, tw- in, in the century he lived in, and in the country he lived in, did not believe that um, Jesus was for anybody other than white people. And he made a statement. He said, look, even the black people are going to raise from the dead, even the Africans. The thing is, he'd never met an African. Never met, he'd never seen anybody that was black. And so what he did was he actually painted paintings from the National Geographic magazine, which was the only reference point he had. So it's an, it's an outrageous painting of liberation and truth. However, uh, it's now being judged by people in the Tate as being deeply racist because he's actually uh, continued racist tropes of projecting black people as, um, uh, um, as, as uh, you know, kind of um, African people, as jungle people, as warriors or whatever. Now, here's the point. The people he painted were exactly that. There were people who were from a tribe in Africa that were on a photograph in the National Ge- Geographic magazine. And so the fact he's now been judged as racist seems to me to be uh, um, hugely unfair. Now, this is not a political diatribe. My point is, what you need to get back to is, what was his intention? What was it he wanted to actually illustrate? He wanted to illustrate that Jesus was for everybody. That's what he wanted to illustrate. And our 21st century uh, morality doesn't work in that space. It doesn't work in the space of judging a guy from 150 years ago. And the truth of it is, we are continually bringing our 21st century morality to this book and suggesting that in some ways, the author has got it wrong. Well, I've got some good news for you. What I believe in good news is good news, which is the author's right. We need to understand more of his character. And so one of the things I've learned, and we can take that. Oh, good, it's good. Good, it's gone. Um, one of the things I've learned is I've determined to know this book and not just to read it, but allow it to read me. Because you see, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. If this is true and my life doesn't line up with it, then it's not this that's going to change. It's me that has to change. And I believe for uh, for the sake of the world, that's what we need to be. People who are prepared to stand up to say that this is true. Not to try and, um, you know, uh, reinterpret it through our 21st century morality, but to get a full understanding of what God is saying to us. My friend, I may have shared this story before, I'm not sure, but my friend Simon Mitchell, um, he became a Christian. He was, a, he was about 30, and he heard somebody say, everything in this, word is, uh, in this book is true. And he, he'd not been a Christian, he'd not come from a Christian background. He went, well, if it's true, it's true. And he was a farmer. And his mom said to him, we need to get rid of all those plum trees. They've not given plums for, for 10 years. And he went out to cut them down, and then he went, Hang on. And he prayed for every tree. Be fruitful, be fruitful, be fruitful, be, fr- be fruitful. Twelve trees. He got to the last tree and he thought, I read something else about trees in the Bible. And he went, I curse you in Jesus' name. That harvest time, he had such an abundance of fruit on every tree except the one that he'd cursed, which withered and died. And he was like, well, it says it in the word. It's obviously going to happen. Then he went to court, and he won his court case. And somebody said, that's amazing. You won your court case. And he said, I stood on the word of God. And we went, brilliant. Which chapter? And he went, no, the word of God. I just ripped out bunches of the Bible, stuffed it in my shoes, and I stood on it. 
And, the, and I was just like, isn't God brilliant? That, he, that, that, when you, that when this young Christian went, well, if it's going to be true, I'm going to test it out. And he proved it to be true for himself. I don't recommend, by the way, you rip out books of the Bible and stand on yourself in court. I don't think that's what it meant, but, but God was so gracious. This is true. The third thing I want to say and where I'm going to finish is this. Love your wife and kids. Uh, Andy Hawthorne uh, often says, happy wife, ha- happy life. And I've got to tell you, uh, and, and just to be honest and say, if Leslie, my wife, is not happy, then I'm not happy either. And it's not because when she's miserable, she makes me miserable. It's just that I care about her too much to actually be able to celebrate joy when she's unhappy. See, I desire the best for her. We were older uh, when we got, uh, we got married. We were, uh, we were engaged after 11 months of meeting. We got married after six months, and I've never regretted a day of it. Uh, Proverbs 18.22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and it obtains favor from the Lord. That is my testimony. That I found a good wife and I've obtained favor from the Lord as a result of it. Now, the verse is key because obviously when I met her, well not obviously but let me be very clear, when I met her I was single, okay? And um, I was jointly uh, bringing my kids up and I determined that I wasn't going to get married unless my life was going to be better by being partnered with somebody else. I was prepared to spend the rest of my life single and, and, and how I determined it was this. I, need, uh, I want to find a, a wife who loves Jesus and wants to join me on having an adventure. Um, and so, whilst we were courting, I used to say to Leslie, if we get married, you're going to marry me for adventure. If we get married, you're going to marry me for adventure. And... Uh, over the years, from time to time, I've had to remind her of that when she's going, oh, I don't know if you want to do that. I'm like, we got married for adventure. It's going to be an adventure. I went to Liberia, which was a few years out, out of um, civil war, and it was like one of the places in the world you definitely shouldn't b- visit. It was in the red spot, and the Leslie's like, I don't want you to go. I'm like, you married me for adventure. I'm going on an adventure. And she was like, okay. Um, I, I, th- there's many times when we've had to take uh, risks where we've had to kind of just try something new or go out on the edge. And I've said, come on, we're on an adventure. Now, it's worked really well because, here's the key thing, I know I'm married up. I know that I'm punching above my weight. And by the way, guys, I've met a lot of your wives, and most of you are punching above your weight as well, if not all of you. If you're not, if I don't know you're punching above your weight, that's because I've not met your wife. Like, that's a really, I say to single guys, if you don't think you're punching up, if you don't think you have to work hard and and really have to chase after this woman on a daily basis, then... She's not the person for you. No, if any man thinks she's quite lucky to be with me, that is a recipe for disaster. You need to think, oh my word, I really need to look after this woman. So for me, whether it's regularly buying my wife um, flowers, telling her how much I love her, just being attentive to her, uh, spending time with her, uh, uh, being uh, grateful for what she does. For me, this is not an effort, but it is an intention because I do believe that an excellent wife, who can find she is far more precious than jewels. And God is good. God is good. My wife's an introvert. I'm an extrovert. I like travel. She doesn't enjoy the journey. She loves to stay inside. I need to be outside. But here's the thing. It works. And it's the thing that allows me to be away for days at a time regularly. But we love spending time together but we can live apart. And I love my kids. All the time um, I've had kids, I've been in ministry, and that means I've not had the best salary. Uh, My kids didn't get all the stuff other kids got. But I did what I could. I preferred my kids in weird areas. All my kids got backstage passes to every gig I ever did. They also sat in artist catering and ate whatever the artists were Eating, they got introduced to um, artists that I was working with, and uh, me, and I knew that some people were saying, "Oh, you're showing your kids favoritism," and I was like, "Damn right, I am." 
you better believe that I am. Because I've just been away for 10 days on a tour, and we've got to the UK, and now my kids are going to actually be treated like a prince and a princess. My kids saw their dad going out as well as coming in. They're, my kids didn't get everything that other kids got. But I did believe in that concept of training up the, your ch- a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I've come to believe that that's not a promise. It's a principle, and the principle is with me. So it's my job to train up my kids when they're young, and then it's down to them not to stray away because they've got free will. But I chose to surround my kids with other great adults who shared the same values as me because obviously they got to the point where they thought the dad was an idiot. And uh, when they did, I just wanted them to hang out with other adults that they thought, well, my dad's an idiot, but he's quite cool, or... Uh, my dad's an idiot, but I quite like her. And they shared my values. Um, and there's, you know, the Bible says there's no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. I, 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 and that's where I live, you know, where my kids are walking in truth uh, because I just wanted to love them. And actually, the truth of it is, and this is where I want to land it, is the first thing I'm going to be responsible to God for is my wife and kids. That's a, well, the first thing, actually, is my relationship with him. The second thing is my primary ministry, which is as a husband and a father. God entrusted me with those precious things. And then he's going to say, and what else did you do? It's that order. And so here's the three first principles. Jesus is Lord. The Bible is true. Love your wife and children. I hope that's helpful to you. Certainly in my life, it's been helpful to me. Can I pray for you? Is that okay? Father God, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that even when we're ridiculous people, you still chase after us. Thank you that that you know that if we put you first, all the other good stuff will be added to us. And Father, we commit today to be people who invite you yet again to be the Lord of our lives. Father, we recognize it's not, a, uh, it, 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 it's not a one-off event, but it's an ongoing process, Lord. We ask that you would take more of our lives and make us more like Jesus today. Father, we commit to do the hard yards ourselves, to spend time in your presence, to read your word, to hang out with people who know you more than we do, and to conform our lives to the pattern of truth that you've so eloquently shared Uh, with us through your word and through your example. Come, Holy Spirit, transform our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been watching Message Live. And we hope it's been a great encouragement to you. Would you subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and ring that bell for notifications. And thanks for watching.